part one. You will hear a conversation between a university counsellor and two students, Joseph and Cara. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Joseph. How are you today? Fine, thanks. And Cara, how are you? Good. As we discussed on the phone earlier, I wanted to speak with both of you about the subjects you have chosen to study and how you are managing your time. OK? Yes. I think so. OK, so I'll start with Cara. You've been here for how many months now? I've been here for six months. How are you finding it? It's good. I'm enjoying the course. And what about life outside? Are you making friends and socialising? Not really. People here are quite closed. They don't talk to you. I see. So what do you do after classes? I usually go home and study, and I might go out for a walk, but never really with anyone. Sometimes my roommate Louisa comes with me, but she always seems to be busy. How is this affecting your schoolwork? I don't think it is, but I miss home. Cara, what I suggest for now is that you look into joining one of the social clubs on campus. There are a variety of them. You can go camping, skiing, snorkelling, painting, dancing, reading, horse riding, rowing. There's a list on the school website. Have a look and work out which one you're interested in and which suits your timetable. You'll meet friends that way and people who have the same career interests as you. As for the subjects you've chosen for a career in microbiology, I think you should look into dropping one of your subjects and picking it up again next year as a minor. You have a lot on your plate, and this will just cause great pressure. It doesn't mean that you aren't coping, but you're doing about 10 hours more than the average student a week. Think about it, and we can make another appointment to discuss it. When are you free? I have an hour free usually on Wednesdays at 11.30. OK, good. Come to my office at 11.45 and wait in reception, OK? OK. I'll see you then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Joseph. How are you finding the university? I love it. It's very different from home. Life here is very much focused on study and also socialising through sport. People have been very friendly and curious about my culture. So, you've managed to integrate well? I think so. I've joined the rugby team, something I'd never thought I'd be interested in. And how are your studies going? I think I am doing well. I have a few assignments that need some work, but overall, I'm coping. That's good. I'm happy that you're enjoying the university, but remember, don't let your schoolwork get too far behind, because it will pile up, and before you know it, you will be late handing in work. You know that there's a penalty for handing in work late? No, I didn't. You would have been told at the start of the course, during orientation. I don't remember. You need to remember these things. They are very important. You might be an excellent student, but if you consistently hand in work late, you'll be penalised and you might end up losing your degree over it. That's a lot of years of work, OK? Yes, I'll remember that. <laughs> and also remember that you have to attend 90% of your classes. So far, you have missed five tutorials. Be careful here. These could also cost you your degree. Is there any particular reason you missed these classes? I'd been training for our rugby match the night before and, well, we went out afterwards and I slept past my alarm clock. Joseph, 
I know this culture must be very different from where you come from, but please try and be a little more conservative with your time. I think maybe you should spend more time on your studies and less time on socialising. The subjects you've chosen are intensive. I want you to spend three hours a night studying before you decide to do anything else. I'll make an appointment to see you in a month and we can assess your progress. I'll give you my business card. All my contact details are there. Call me in three weeks to organise another meeting. Do you have any questions for me? No, none. OK, I'll see you in a month. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear three students talking to their tutor about the presentation they are planning. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everyone. So, you're going to tell me about your presentation. First of all, what's your topic? Did you say you were going to talk about the uses of mobile phones? Uh, not exactly. We're actually going to explain the dangers of using mobile phones. Ah, OK. That sounds interesting. What are you going to discuss exactly? Well, we've planned to divide the presentation into three sections. We'll have an introduction explaining why we think it's important to understand the dangers of mobiles. Then, on the second slide, we'll have a list of the different types of danger. And then on the last slide, we're going to suggest ways of staying out of danger when you use a mobile. Yes, we want to start by telling the audience that using a mobile phone can be dangerous and then go into more detail in the next part. OK, but before you talk about the dangers of mobiles, I think you should mention the advantages. You could put that in your introduction. It balances up the argument a bit. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Right, we'll do that. So... Shall we have a look at your presentation? Did you bring it with you? I've got it here on a memory stick. Can we show you on your computer? Yes, that's fine. Let's have a look. Hmm. Right. As you say, you're going to add the advantages of using mobile phones to the first slide. Good. Who's going to explain the second slide with all the dangers? That's me. Do you think I've got enough detail? Yes. I think there's plenty of information, but I think it's all a bit mixed up at the moment. I mean, you've got dangers like getting headaches in the same list as having car accidents and being robbed in the street. They're all different types of danger, aren't they? I think you should divide them into groups, maybe under separate titles like health, accidents and security. Oh, right. Yes, thank you. That will make it much clearer to the audience. Mm. OK. Now, in the third slide, you can put your suggestions for staying away from each of these dangers under separate titles. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Have you got any other questions? Um, yes. The presentation should be for 10 minutes. Is that right? Yes. But 10 minutes in total, including 3 minutes for questions. So you'll only talk for 7 minutes. That's only 2 minutes each. We won't be able to say much in that time at all. That's why you have to plan what you're going to say carefully and make sure you only include the most important information. For instance, you won't have time to give examples, but you could put some images on your slides that show examples without spending time talking about them. Hey, that's a good idea. And the audience can look at them while we talk. And another thing. Make sure all the slides have the same style. You should get together and agree on one style for the whole presentation. OK, we'll do that too. Thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students, David and Claire. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, David. How are you going with your history studies? Very well. I've actually finished it. That's great. What era did you write on? I researched Roman London, something I never thought I'd be interested in. That sounds interesting. I wanted to tie it into the work I've been doing on engineering, and I found it fascinating. <laughs> and learned many things along the way. Such as? Well, although there were prehistoric settlements throughout the vast area now called London, strangely enough, no evidence has yet been found for any such community at the northern end of London Bridge, where the present city grew up. The origins of London lie in Roman times, right? Right. When the Romans invaded Britain in 43 AD, they moved north from the Kentish coast and traversed the Thames in the London region, clashing with the local tribesmen just to the north. It has been suggested that the soldiers crossed the river at Lambeth, but it was further downstream that they built a permanent wooden bridge, just east of the present London Bridge, in more settled times some seven years later. As a focal point of the Roman road system, it was the bridge which attracted settlers and led to London's inevitable growth. So, London Bridge has been there for hundreds of years? Yes, and though the regularity of London's original street grid may indicate that the initial inhabitants were the military, trade and commerce soon followed. The London Thames was deep and still within the tidal zone, an ideal place for the birthing of ships. What other industry did they have? Well, as the area was also well-drained and low-lying, it was geologically suitable for brick-making. There was soon a flourishing city called Londinium in the area where the monument now stands. Londinium? That's Latin. That's what I thought too, but the name itself is Celtic, not Latin, and may originally have referred merely to a previous farmstead on the site. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Wasn't London burned to the ground at some stage? It happened in AD 60 by the forces of Queen Boudicca of the Iceni tribe from modern Norfolk when she led a major revolt against Roman rule. The governor, Suetonius Paulinus, who was busy exterminating the Druids in North Wales, marched his troops south in an attempt to save London, but, seeing the size of Boudicca's approaching army, decided he could not mount an adequate defence and evacuated the city instead. Not everyone managed to escape, though, and many were massacred. What about the beautiful old architecture? Did you research that too? I sure did. The major symbol of Roman rule was the Temple of the Imperial Cult. Emperor worship was administered by the Provincial Council, whose headquarters appear to have been in London by AD 100. A member of its staff, named Anencletus, buried his wife on Ludgate Hill around this time. Pagan worship flourished within the cosmopolitan city. A temple to the mysterious eastern god Mithras was found at Bucklersbury House and is displayed nearby. I quite like St Paul's. Traditionally, St Paul's Cathedral stands on the site of a temple of Diana. Other significant buildings also began to appear in the late first century, at a time when the city was expanding rapidly. The Forum, a marketplace and basilica which housed the law courts complex at Leadenhall Market, was erected and then quickly replanned as the largest such complex north of the Alps. The Forum was much bigger than today's Trafalgar Square. Who was in charge of all the town planning at the time? Procurator Agricola. He encouraged the use of bathhouses and had a grand public suite made, which has now been excavated in Upper Thames Street. They were as much a social venue as a place to bathe. There was a smaller version at Cheapside, and in later centuries, private bathhouses were also built. Another popular attraction was the wooden amphitheatre, erected on the northwestern outskirts of the city. It's possible that gladiatorial shows were put on here, though lesser public sports, like bear baiting, may have been more regular. I thought that happened mainly in the Colosseum in Rome, but I guess London being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the conversation between Andrew and Samantha. Complete the summary by writing one suitable word in the numbered spaces. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Does your work bring you into contact with many overseas students, Samantha? Occasionally. As you know, a solicitor's work is to advise people about their rights when they have any problems understanding how the law operates. They may need help because of injury to themselves or their property if they've been attacked or robbed, for example. 
But these are not by any means the main problems I deal with. Really? We know more about crime, I suppose, because we read about it in the newspaper or see it on TV. What other things do people come to you for help with? There are lots of things which don't get nearly so much attention. Sometimes it's to do with relationships in the community, as when bills aren't paid or contracted work isn't completed or neighbours disagree. At other times, it's to do with people not understanding the law and their responsibilities, and this is probably where overseas students have the most difficulty. One interesting example is customs laws, something which every new arrival has to come up against. What is it that overseas students find most difficult to understand about Australian customs regulations? I think it's a shock to many people arriving here for the first time to find out how many things are prohibited. Everyday food items, for example. I mean, when I've been travelling overseas, I've been quite amazed at the lack of concern in some countries about food being brought in from other parts of the world without any check. You mean people arriving into other countries don't have to declare any foodstuffs at all? In some countries, there are lots of warnings about drugs and firearms, and there are usually limits on alcohol and tobacco, and perhaps perfume. But food's not mentioned. Yes, I suppose I never thought about it till I came here. You can take anything you like into England as far as food is concerned. You see, here... You can't even drive from one state to another with a few apples and oranges for the journey. There are signs to remind you not to bring any fruit into some states, though they don't usually search your bags unless there's a fruit fly epidemic or something. Hmm. With those kinds of regulations between states, it's no wonder that they're so strict about what you can bring in from overseas. Of course, farmers would be wiped out if some pests were introduced which destroyed their whole crop. It's easy to understand why you should take steps to prevent that. And with food being such an important part of many cultures, it can be difficult for some people to realise they're not allowed to bring in delicacies from home for friends and relatives here. I'm defending someone at the moment who is exactly that problem. Oh, uh, what happened? It's an interesting case. Have you got time for a cup of coffee? I'll tell you about it if you like. That'd be great. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.